The text this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 7, starting at verse 3. These are the words of God. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Therefore, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Father God, we rejoice in your Christmas kindness to us. We thank you for your Son. We rejoice in your Spirit. We are hungry for your word. Help us to understand it now. We ask in Jesus' name, and amen. Amen. This encounter in the Gospel of John records an interaction that Jesus had with at least some of his brothers. As we've considered in this series, first we talked about what Joseph knew, what the Bible tells us, what what do we know about Joseph and what Joseph knew. We uh, considered last week... um, the Lord's mother, Mary. And this week, I want to ask what the Lord's brothers and sisters knew. What what vantage uh, did they have? What advantage did they have? What advantage did they have? What disadvantage might they have had? We've learned already that Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. So it, it mentions his sisters in the plural, so there are at least two sisters. He had four brothers, Mark 6, 3 and Matthew 13, 55 and 56. We are given his brothers' names. The names of his brothers were James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon. Now, some of you might think, you know, there's an experiment. If you have four boys, you could name them Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Herbert um, to, th- to throw people off. You have, you have Jesus. The, all the names begin with J, J except for Simon. I don't, uh, Jesus, James, Joseph, Judah, and then Simon. What's that? James was the author of the book of James that we have in, your, in our New Testaments, and Judah was the author of the book of Jude. Uh, in Jude 1.1, he identifies himself as the brother of James. So James is the brother of the Lord. Uh, Judah is the brother of James. With Joseph and Mary having that number of children, Jesus being uh, Mary, Mary having at least seven children, Uh, With Joseph and Mary having that number of children, it would not be hard for their descendants to number in the many millions today. That means you ought to be nicer to the person you're sitting next to because they might be related to Jesus. But of course, we're going to see shortly that the Lord calculates that sort of thing very differently than, than we might do. So what do we consider here in the text? At this point in the Lord's ministry... The Lord's brothers were not persuaded by him. All the indications are that they were a pious household, but the brothers were not believers. They didn't believe in him. They were were not believers. They were pious Jews. We see that uh, from the feast. They're, They're attending the Feast of Booths here, so they're making the journey to Jerusalem to observe the law. They're observing the Feast of Booths here, but they did not believe the claims that Jesus was making. Jesus rounded up some fishermen to follow him, but his brothers weren't among his disciples. His brothers were not following him. In fact, they taunted him. If you want to make a name for yourself, they said, you have to go down to the big city to do that. If you're going to do miracles, if you're going to do the sort of thing that we hear, uh, hear uh, people, telling, uh, people saying that you're doing, you need to get down to the big city and do them there so you can get a, a, an appropriate crowd. The text then says explicitly that they were talking this way because they did not believe in him. So the Lord's brothers were not believers. The Lord's brothers did not believe in him. The reply that Jesus makes to them shows the true nature of the true antithesis. It's the true nature of the true antithesis, and it's going to point at what it really means to be related to Jesus, what it really means to be uh, a member of his household. Jesus says that every time is, quote, their time. Every time, any time in the world's history is the time that belongs to the the kind of person that you are. 
But his time, Jesus says, his time has not yet come, verse 6. The world cannot hate them, but it means that in some sort of fundamental way, they were still part of the world system. All right, the Lord's brothers were still on the side of the world. They, they don't believe in Jesus, and, and because Jesus teaches explicitly, you're either with me or against me, you're either gathering or scattering, it's either one way or the other way. If they weren't believers in him, then that means they belonged to the world. Sons of Joseph and Mary, all indications, pious, good members of the synagogue, doing what they needed to do, didn't believe in Jesus. Jesus, however, testified to the world that its works were evil in a way that his brothers could not do. He told them to go up to the feast, which they did, verses 8 and 9. Jesus followed later, but he did so secretly. Now, if we didn't know, if this text didn't tell us that Jesus was interacting with his brothers, and all we had to go on was the dialogue, uh, the world cannot hate you, the world hates me, uh, any time is your time. If we took, just took the dialogue out and said that Jesus was talking with somebody in the New Testament and we didn't know, we would assume that Jesus was talking to his adversaries, to his enemies, to the Pharisees. Right? That, that's what we would see. They, they were, and Now, all the indications are, and this is a, another little uh, clue that we can piece together, uh, the false teachers, the Judaizers, the bad guys in the Christian church after the Lord's resurrection, um, it says certain men came from James, and, they, and, and when Paul's talking about this in Galatians, he's very explicit that he and James got along. Paul and James extended to one another the right hand of fellowship. So James was not uh, agreeing with the men who said that they were from him, but that slander was plausible, right? In other words, there were men who could take James's position and misrepresent it. All the indications are that James became the head of the church in Jerusalem. He was a very pious Jew. He was, he, he, and he kept, he kept the law even after, he was, um, even after he believed in Jesus. And you can see his zeal for these sorts of things in the book of James. And, and James and Paul had to labor to make sure that they are seen as being on the same page. And they had to labor for a reason. So James is um, not a Judaizer. But there are Judaizers who could claim to be from him, even after he's a Christian. So he, he is clearly a pious man. He's clearly a pious man. He's going to the Feast of Booths. He doesn't believe in Jesus. And Jesus says, you are fundamentally of the world. Now, this is why separatism, artificial physical separatism, does not work. All right? You can be the most arch separatist, and I'm going to separate from the world. And you've just discovered that that's a worldly thing to do. That's the sort of thing that the world loves to do. Well, Jesus says, you, you, you guys are of the world. The world cannot hate you. You're, you're playing right along with the world. And then he says, go up to the feast. They do. And then Jesus follows along behind them uh, secretly. Now, several of the other disciples of the 12 were named James also. See, this is one of those things where you can't tell the players without a scorecard. Uh, one was a son of Alphaeus. One of the, one of the 12 was a son of Alphaeus. Um, his name was James. And you recall I said last week that James is the English form of the Hebrew Jacob. So uh, uh, their names were, James's name was actually Jacob. So you have Jacob or James, the son of Alphaeus, Acts 1.13. Another was the son of Zebedee, brother to John. And he was martyred by Herod. And the, that martyrdom is recounted in Acts 12, 1 and 2. So James and John, sons of Zebedee, were the famous sons of thunder. So you have John, who wrote the Gospel of John, and James, his brother, and he was martyred by Herod. A third James was James, the Lord's brother. And he was a leader in the church at Jerusalem. And he was called James the Just by Hegesippus, who was a second century historian. He was called James the Just, and his piety and his devotion to the law and his commitment to the law of Moses, but in a Christian context in Jerusalem, was renowned. This James is the one who wrote the book of James. His brother Jude, another half-brother to the Lord, wrote the book of Jude. All right, so all of the Lord's relations, all, all, all of the references that we have to the Lord's siblings prior to the resurrection indicate that they were not 
impressed with him. They were not impressed with him. We have evidence of this in our text from John 7, of course, and in Mark, when Jesus made his first big stir. Jesus um, showed up, and there was a big happening. There was a crowded house. And it says the mother and brothers of the Lord showed up in order to take Jesus in hand. You know, this, this whole thing is spiraling out of control. And so these people are the, the, the Lord's brothers and Lord's mother show up to take him in hand. And we see that this is what's going on by the response that the Lord gives to them. Then came, then came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them which sat about him and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and mother. Now, Jesus, this goes back to the comment I made before. There, there could be, honestly, there could be many millions of people in the world today descended from Joseph and Mary. That is quite a possibility. And it's the sort of thing that you might say, well, that would be, that would be a fun thing to, uh, to find on Ancestry.com. You're not, you're not it would, well, it would be fun for about 15 minutes before you started bossing everybody around. Uh, the point is that Jesus says here, fundamentally, when the Lord's brothers were right outside the house and his mother was right outside the house, Jesus says in that setting, you know, that doesn't matter. Who's my, who's my mother? Who's my sister? Who's my brother? He says, anyone, anyone in this room, and we can extend it on the authority of the word of God, anyone in this room, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? Anyone who does the will of God. In the third century, blood relatives of the Lord were called deposni, uh, those belonging to the master. So there was, in the third century, they still had some sense of people who were descended from the Holy Family. They, they had a name for them in the third century. And something like that would be fun to discover. But look how the Lord places everything in perspective. Anyone can be his brother. Anyone can be his sister. Anyone can be his mother. How? By doing the will of God. And what is the will of God? What is the work of God? We're going to consider that shortly, but the will of God, the work of God, is to, um, is to uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The work of God is to believe. So, before the resurrection, to the extent that we have information about it, it shows that the Lord's siblings did not believe in him. We know that Mary did believe in him, but there were family dynamics going on, clearly. All right? So Mary shows up with the brothers when, when they show up to do something about this stir that Jesus, uh, uh, that Jesus had caused. But there is, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of undercurrents, a lot of things going on here. Mary believes in him, we know from other texts. But we have a lot of family cross-currents. But immediately after the resurrection, everything apparently changed. Everything apparently changed. And that's what matters. What matters is faith in Jesus, not proximity to Jesus. What matters is faith in Jesus, not proximity to Jesus. Immediately after the resurrection, everything is transformed. After the resurrection, it flips. After the resurrection, we don't have any record of unbelief in the Lord's family. After the resurrection, there's no record of unbelief at all. James, the Lord's brother, is reckoned among the apostles in Galatians 1.19. He's reckoned as a pillar in the church in Galatians 2.9. The Lord's brothers were reckoned among those in ministry in 1 Corinthians 9.5. And the key appears to have been the fact that Jesus made an appearance to James after the resurrection. So in 1 Corinthians 15.7. So James, the Lord's brother, was singled out by the Lord. The Lord came back from the dead and Jesus appeared to him. That's, it's interesting because that's the one instance we have of the Lord appearing after, after his resurrection to an unbeliever, right? He appears to the disciples. He appears to those who followed him. But here's an instance where he seeks out a family member. He seeks out his brother and appears to him after the resurrection. It's also striking if you're reading through Micah. In Micah chapter 5, you have the, the very famous verse that predicts the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. 
And the scribes knew about this. This is why they told Herod, Herod that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem. It's interesting that the verse right after the verse that predicts that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem, it says, and his brothers will return to him. Uh, Micah 5, 3. Micah 5, 2, the Lord is going to be Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a small, tiny town, and uh, they are going to be honored with the birth of the Messiah. The next verse, his brothers will return to him. So, what is faith then? What is faith? Scripture tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let me say that again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There may be all kinds of distractions. There may be all sorts of things in your life. There may be all sorts of uh, background issues. There may be all sorts of sins that you're grappling with. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God is not bound by anything. So Romans 10, 17 Faith, brings, uh, faith comes to you by the word of God. Scripture tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. But most of all, we see in Scripture that faith is a gift, faith is a grace, faith is a present. Faith is a present, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And it says, uh, by grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The faith is, is um, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The gift, and this is the point of this message, the gift is not automatic. Someone could have grown up right next to Jesus, in the bedroom next to his. Someone could have grown up right next to Jesus, in the bedroom next to him, being brought up by the same father and mother, attending the same synagogue, using the same bathroom down the hall or whatever it was, there, you, you know, growing up in the same household, an actual household, having all the jostling and the back and forth and the to and froing and, and how they had breakfast together and how they would eat together, having all of, all of that together. Someone could grow, grow up right next to Jesus, as the Lord's brothers did, and not have faith. Proximity does not create faith. Proximity does not create faith. An encounter with the risen Christ does. James had everything. If, if proximity could do it, what, what didn't James have? If proximity could do it, what didn't he have? Well, he didn't have an encounter with the risen Christ. He didn't have the gift of faith. He didn't have the grace of God coming to him. Proximity does not create faith. Now, we understand the connection between the baby Jesus and the risen Jesus because we have heard the entire story. But there are many people who want a sentimental Christmas with the baby Jesus only. They only want the baby Jesus because they want a sentimental Christmas and, they don't, and the baby isn't going to mess with them. The baby is not going to interfere with their sins. The baby is not going to take over their life. The baby is not going to uh, do what they are afraid that Jesus might do. If he stays in the crib, he can't mess around with their life. Genuine faith cannot function in this way. So if we flip back one chapter to John chapter 6, verse 29. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, oh, let me back up. He says, then said they unto him, what shall we do? that we might work the works of God. What shall we do, he says, what, they said, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that ye believe whom he hath sent. Now, there's two ways you can say, that he could say, this is the work I want you to do, believe, that, you know, this is, no, don't do all those works stuff, I want you to do the work of believing. But I think there's another way to take that. He says, they, they say, puffing themselves up. How can we deserve? How can we earn? How can we, how can we merit? What, do, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So that we, 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 we might work the works of God. What shall we do? And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe. When you believe, that's God's work. When you believe, God is at work. When you believe, God is moving. 
When you believe, the Spirit has moved. We want to take credit ourselves. We want, to, we want it all to somehow come down to my wise choices or my good deeds or my endearing smile. Or my, you know, we, we want somehow to get some credit for it. But God gives no credit. He gives grace. He gives mercy. He gives salvation. He gives forgiveness. He gives no credit. <laughs> None. You can't, you can't. Jesus was born into this world in order to save a dark and lost planet, a dark and lost sinful race. He was born into this world to put everything to rights. He was not born into this world in order to give us a helping hand so that he might do a little bit and we might do a little bit and then working together we might have some sort of, um, some sort of arrangement made. The Christmas Carol, Little Town of Bethlehem, um, has the in invitation, be born in us today. Be born in us today. And it's not good enough to have Jesus born in proximity to you. It's not enough to have Jesus born of the same mother as you. It's not enough to have Jesus alongside you. Jesus was alongside Judas. Jesus was alongside Peter, he was alongside Andrew, and he was alongside Judas. Jesus was alongside James and Joseph and Judah and Simon and his sisters. Jesus was in proximity to them all. And they were children of Joseph and Mary, and that was not sufficient. Proximity is not sufficient. In, Jesus can't be born next to you. Jesus can't be born in your world. Jesus can't be born in a town that you can go to on a pilgrimage. You could all get a plane ticket and go to Bethlehem and, and visit the town where he was born. There, there's di dispute. There are disputes and debates about where actually it was, where was the nativity in Bethlehem. But you know that it was somewhere in this town. We know what town it was. You could go to the town where Jesus was born and walk up and down the streets, and proximity won't do it. Proximity can't do it. If proximity could do it, then James was in. But James, Jesus said in John 7, belonged to the world. His brothers belonged to the world. They were right next to Jesus, and they belonged to the world. Jesus has to be born in us, not next to us. Not in our world, not in our country, not in our tribe, not in our city, not on our street. Jesus has to be born in us, be born in us today. You might say, but I don't want him to be, you know... My, the, my stable in here is kind of ratty. Well, all stables are. You know, I, don't, I don't have anything. You, you, I can't have Jesus born in here. Cattle live in here. This place smells. This place stinks. All I have to put him in is a little manger. Wouldn't be the first time. right? The, that whole thing is a representation of what God does. We, we sometimes get a, a wrong view of what stables are like from looking at Christmas cards from a distance. You know, we, we say, oh, isn't that romantic, and isn't that sweet, and isn't that, I can hear Christmas carols singing, and I can hear the choir, and they're, they're on pitch, and I can, I can you know, I can, all this stuff. But you actually go into the stable, right? The old farmer joke, it smells like money, right? It, it, basically, that's the, con that's the condition of our lives. That's the condition of our hearts. That's the kind of place where Jesus has to come. Jesus has to be born in us. Jesus has to be established in us. Not next to us. We, ha we can't be associated with him. We can't be linked to him, not even covenantally. We can be covenantally linked to him. We can have a true attachment to him that is not a saving attachment to him. All right, James and Joseph and Judah and Simon and his sisters had a true attachment to him. They were truly part of his family. They truly had the same mother. They had an attachment to him. But it wasn't a believing attachment. The, belie the, the salvation comes when you have an encounter with the risen Christ. With, the, with, the Lord, with, with James, this happened with an actual resurrection appearance. Since that time, since the Lord ascended into heaven, every encounter with the risen Christ is brought about, is accomplished by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does is he takes the gospel, the message of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and his ascension to the right hand of God the Father. It takes that message, 
Jesus Christ is publicly placarded as crucified, crucified for the sins of the world. That message is declared. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and hearing the, the, the word of God is proclaimed and the spirit takes that word and he applies it sovereignly to anyone he pleases. That's how it comes. That's how Jesus is born in our hearts. That's how the message spreads. That's how new life spreads. This is the work of God that you believe. This is the work of God that you believe. When we believe, it's not because we arranged it. When we believe, you might say, well, why do I believe? At the end of the day, it's, the answer to that is I just do. Why do I believe? Because God gave it to me. Why do I believe? Because the Holy Spirit gave me a present. And the present was the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, James knew the historical facts, right? James knew that Jesus, no doubt knew that Jesus was arrested. No doubt knew that he was crucified. No doubt knew that he was buried. He knew the facts. He may even heard that the body had disappeared. But he didn't believe until the Lord appeared to him. And then he believed. Like Thomas. Thomas doubted. And then when the Lord appeared to him, he cried out, My Lord and my God. James didn't encounter the Lord Jesus after his resurrection and say, Oh, my brother. It would have been like Thomas. My Lord and my God. Something far beyond all mortal reckoning is going on here. God invaded our race. He invaded our world so that he may invade every human heart. And that's what, the gospel, that's what gospel proclamation is all about. Jesus was born in Bethlehem so that he could be born in every individual heart. Jesus was born in Bethlehem so that he could be crucified and rise, so that he could be crucified and rise in every human heart. That's what baptism means. I've been baptized into his death. Why? If you're, if you're united with him in his death, you're also united with him in his resurrection. The whole point, the whole point of the gospel, the point of the incarnation, the point of the gospel, the point of the death, burial, and resurrection is to erase proximity. God, that's what God's up to. He wants to close the distance he wants to erase proximity. He wants to overcome your attempts to keep your deity, your God, your religion at arm's length. That's what every sinner wants to do. I want my God out here where things are safe. I want my God out here where things are tidy. I want my God out here where he won't come into this stable of my heart and see what a mess it is. I want it safe. I want it predictable. I want it respectable. I want it all out here. And what God does in the gospel is he overcomes, he overwhelms, he conquers our attempts to keep it a, a matter of proximity. He overwhelms proximity. And he comes into your life. And when he comes into your life, you can't keep it the same. It's transformed. It's overhauled. He forgives you. He cleanses you. He washes you clean. Everything is undone, and everything that you've carefully established before, it's all undone. Looking back beforehand, you were kind of upset at the prospect of it being undone. Afterwards, when you look back on it, it was the best thing that ever happened to you. All my, my whole little house of cards, everything I'd built up, everything I'd established, everything I'd worked for, everything I wanted to be, all the self-image that I had of myself, all of that goes down, collapses. Why? Because God in the gospel erases proximity. You cannot, you cannot have a safe God. Not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is an in-your-face God. More than that, the God of the Bible is an in-your-heart God. Now, we can reduce this. This is one of the tricks that we have of creating proximity. We say, oh, okay, Jesus in your heart, God in your heart, all of that is true. Let's turn it into a cliche. Let's take this this staggering truth about how God has closed the diff di distance between creator and creature, how God can come into a human life, and how Christ can be in us, the hope of glory. This is the, the teaching of the Bible. We, we take that and we turn it into a cliche. If we say, well, this, this, how do you become a Christian? Well, you pray and ask Jesus in your heart. We turn it into a cliche, so we grab it and put it out here again. But think about what you mean, Jesus in your heart. What do you mean, Heart. What do you mean, Jesus? What do you mean, God? What do you mean, forgiveness? Think about the words you're using. And when, and when it's not a cliche, when you're not just saying the deal, when you're not just praying the prayer that you found in the back of a book but somewhere, when you think, Jesus, and my, my life, and my heart, 
and gospel. And Jesus was crucified for me and was buried for me and rose from the dead for me. He rose from the dead for my justification. When all of those things are true and it comes down to the point, you are undone. I'm undone. We're all undone. But God never leaves anything undone. He always unmakes us. He always comes in to scatter everything, mess everything up, so that he may refashion us, so that he may recreate us, so that we may be established and recreated in the image of God, found in Christ. And that's what Christmas is all about. We're celebrating, we're celebrating the opening gambit in a long game that God has established. This was established before God determined to do this before the world was created. And then when the time was fully right, Jesus was born of a virgin, born under the law. When the time was fulfilled, everything was, this was a masterpiece of timing. He was, lived a perfect sinless life, was crucified, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven. And he's been pouring out his, the gift of forgiveness ever since. And that gift of forgiveness is being poured out daily, uh, every day in this world, somebody's converted. Every day, someone is turned around, and they never volunteer for it. So it's always God saying, you, now you, now you, come with me. It's like Jesus approaching the fishermen. Follow me. When Jesus says, efficaciously, sovereignly, follow me, that's what you will do. That's what he did with James. He appeared to him and said, follow me. And James and his brothers did. The good news is that all the defenses, all the pretenses, all the things that we cook up to keep God away, that we try to fend him off, God just in the gospel, in the incarnation, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God just blows right past all of that. God saves sinners. That's what this is all about. God saves sinners. Whether or not the sinners want to be saved, God saves sinners. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.